Welcome, everyone. I am Joan Patterson. I am with the Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates, otherwise known as CORFA. And we are delighted that so many of you are attending this um, Zoom call with Cynthia Martinez, the Chief of Refuges today. All right. So these webinars are produced by the Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates and the National Wildlife Refuge Association. We do them on a monthly basis, and it is an opportunity for us to provide resources and friends to provide resources to one another and also catch up on what is going on. We have been very fortunate that Cynthia has been doing this annual chat for, with friends. I think it's now her third or fourth time doing it with us. And before I introduce Cynthia, I just want to thank um, the Refuge Association for making this possible. Especially Eden, our technical genius that makes the whole thing works and gets the invitations out and all. And um, the the board of CORFA that does so much work on trying to get the speakers and organize things. So thank you everybody for your participation and for everyone's work on this. So let me introduce Cynthia. She is Cynthia Martinez, chief of the National Wildlife Refuge, um, not association, but system. She has been with Fish and Wildlife Service since 1993. And we were lucky to have her come to headquarters in 2010. And when she first came on board, she spearheaded the effort to, you know, develop a new vision for the refuge system with the conference in 2011 called Conserving the Future, which has really provided a lot of direction for the refuge system over since that time. 2012 to 2015, she was deputy chief. And in 2015, she was made chief. Personally, I've known Cynthia for a while now. And what I know about her is that she really cares about the refuge system. She cares about the habitat. She cares about the wildlife. She cares about the people that are involved. Um, this has been, I think, you know, for anybody taking on her position, an extremely frustrating time with the declining budgets, the increased workload, all of that going on. I know it must be, or I'm assuming at times it must be very frustrating for Cynthia, but I will say that she is always a champion for the refuge system. And what I have found is she has always been a champion for friends. So thank you, Cynthia. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Joan. I'm sorry about that. I was like, I hear you. I'm here. I just can't get my camera turned on. I couldn't get my unmute. But it would just mean I'm mute. It wouldn't mean anything. Yes, we've been each other for a long time, Joan, and I appreciate our friendship as well. Uh, I've known several, lots of you for quite some time. That's what happens when you stick around for a long time and get to know a lot more people. Yes, and I was on a, on a previous webinar and um, it was kind of fun because there were some friends that were on the last call as well. And I was like, I really have to jump over because I've got more friends waiting on the other screen. And um, so apologies again for being a bit party, but I really do appreciate you all inviting us to this conversation. But just first of all, I appreciate everything that each of you do as a friend at whichever of your favorite National Wildlife Refuge, and in some cases, probably plural, National Wildlife Refuge is, um, because we just need that much help, don't we? Um, it's always fun to come and chat with you all and um, catch up. Uh, this is the time of year where we start to talk about um, budget. And so the, today we're gonna talk about the fiscal year 24 budget and our priorities. Um, as many of you know, it's, Congress is a little delayed in getting us out of funding. And in fact, Treasury still hasn't released the funds, but um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna show a PowerPoint and kind of run through that and then um I think that there'll be plenty of time left at the end for us to have some conversations. And um, that works for, for you all doing. Um, so again, I really just appreciate the invitation and the time. So thank you for that. Okay, 
So, as you all know, and I don't have to tell you, but I will because it's fun, the National Life Refuge System is a great public investment. What the heck? Can you all hear me still? It's, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I can still hear you, Cynthia. Okay, well, so Zoom is asking me if I have switched to a different language and wants to know if I want to used to Arabic and I'm like Arabic and you don't want to speak Arabic sorry <laughs> I'm having a challenge here okay let's go back to this great public investment that we all know and love it's an actual life refuge system that provides benefits to the service the conservation community and to the public with habitats in all ecosystems the refuge system is truly the cornerstone to building a resilient future for wildlife and for people. With refuge units near communities of all sizes, the refuge system prioritizes equity in wildlife conservation and access to nature. We are committed to building an inclusive organizational culture by supporting youth internships to build diverse agency capacity. Now, because of chronically low funding levels, as you all know, the refuge system is experiencing decreased service delivery, and that compromises protection of wildlife and habitat, as well as visitor experience and safety and opportunities for volunteers. Now, we're seeing increasing demands due to climate change, this climate crisis that we're in, and biodiversity loss, and aging infrastructure, and a need to create enriching and safe experiences for more and more visitors. Due to declining budgets and inflation, investment in the National Life Refuge System makes meeting these demands challenging. And you see the statistics, the facts on the left side of this slide, in 2010, was always a benchmark that we use when we come and have these conversations with you all. So you can see that we've added 21 new refugees uh, since that time. And we've had an uh, increase of almost 24 million annual visitors. Now, over this same time, uh, this slide also shows that inflation has reduced our buying power of our budget by $212 million, which is a result in a 42% reduction in capacity to restore habitats, uh, inspire school children, provide quality wildlife dependent recreation, and hire and retain diverse employees. So even though that we are seeing an increase in visitation and environmental demands, our staff numbers, our full-time equivalents, or FTEs, they have declined by 27% since 2001. And volunteer numbers are down by 40%, while our um, visitation has increased by 50% over the same period. So when it comes to volunteering, as you all know, there are endless needs for volunteer support, and our volunteers are amazing and have so many um, expertise, so much expertise to, to offer. But the reduction of volunteers, it's not just a result of COVID. So as you can see, the decrease in volunteers, which is that orange line, is proportional to the reduction in our workforce, which is that top line. A decrease in Fish and Wildlife Service employees means that our ability to support coordinated and meaningful experiences for volunteers is truly limited. So let me let me give you some uh, maybe perspective. So in 2010, we had over 42,000 volunteers, and they served almost 1.5 uh, million hours. And if you break that down and do the math it equals almost 700 full-time employees. So the hours that those almost, you know, over 42,000 volunteers provided would have would have added up to 700 employees on national effective. Now in 2023, 
we had almost 21,000 volunteers, so a decrease in like half. And they uh, served almost 900,000 uh, hours. And so if you break that down into staff or full-time equivalents, it would be almost 425 full-time staff. So we've gone from volunteers providing 700 hours of staff time down to 425 hours of staff. So there's a few things you need to know about the FY fiscal year 24 budget. So all of the non-defense agencies received a budget reduction, but the reductions are different across agencies and bureaus. So due to our efforts to share our story, return on investment and all the work happening across the refuge system, the work that you all are doing from an advocacy standpoint, the work that CARA has done, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the refuge system received a smaller decrease than other bureaus or agencies. So the average reduction of the non-defense agencies under the first appropriations bill is a 3.85% reduction. The services reduction was 2.85%. And the refuge system reduction was 2.68%. So even within the Fish and Life Service, the refuge system received a little, like less of a cut than what the Fish and Wildlife Service would do. Now, to ensure that our employees' wages are not losing more ground with inflation and that they're consistent with their private sector wages, our employees received a much deserved pay increase. It is important to note, however, that when we consider the inflationary losses, like for every 1% pay increase, it requires a $3 million increase in appropriations, which we didn't get. So if they give us an increase in pay and salary and not the funding to go with it, we still have to find it. So to mitigate budget cuts on resource management accounts, which fund our salaries, benefits, and the management capability the dollars we use to actually manage the process system, we work with the Department of the Interior, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and Congress to take more from projects than our base funding loans. Now, this approach helps us maintain essential essential services while prioritizing the system's critical habitat for species and infrastructure needs, and it provides a better return on investment. So we are going to continue to leverage other funding sources like the Great American Outdoors Act, that's what GOA is, the um, infrastructure law, what I always forget what he stands for, and then the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, to support positions to the extent that we're allowed to under the law, because each of those gives us side goals uh, by which we have to, we can, we can expend those dollars. But we've used these other funding sources to support our employees in continuing their work. And a, a high priority in our work with partners is working to make the Great American Outdoors Act funding permanent, although I'm hearing that it's not going very well. Um, it has been invaluable because it's provided up to $95 million a year to the National Wildlife Refuge System to provide projects and positions that help address our deferred maintenance backlog, but it expires in fiscal year 2025. So the Great American Outdoors Act really must be reauthorized and preferably made permanent, just like the Land and Water Conservation Fund, or LWCF was, as well as increasing the services authorization to $285 million annually, and expanding it to include all of the Fish and Wildlife Service constructed infrastructure. You see, the National Fish Capacity System wasn't included in GOA. Thank you, bipartisan, and that's what the B stands for, bipartisan infrastructure one. Um, Anyhow, the National Fish Hatchery System wasn't included in the original BOA authorization. Um, 
but it would really be awesome if we could get that many authorized permit. So, shifting gears, let's talk about the power of storytelling, something that our friends are really good at. The budget process is more than just numbers, right? It's a platform for us to articulate the narrative of the reckoning system. Now, our narrative strategy is twofold. We highlight the benefits our work provides to people, wildlife, and meeting climate resilience priorities, and in other words, the public good. We also stress how efficiently we do this work for basically our high return on investment. We are really a good investment. Give us a phone to spend it with, we told you we'd spend it, and we're we'll good efficiently. And then we spotlight the pressing need for support due to chronic underfunding, underfunding, and we detail impacts that compromise resources and visitor opportunity, experience, and safety. But why is a unified story so crucial? Because it's not just about telling, it's about resonating. And that only comes with a compelling and consistent story told through budget narratives, public awareness campaigns, and through partners and friends. This narrative not only illustrates the challenges and successes we face, but it's a primary way we can influence budget decisions, priorities, and legislative action. It's important to recognize that our narrative doesn't always match our approach. Yes, that's what I really said. It's important to recognize that our narrative doesn't always match our report, our approach. Because why? Because often our pride and passion for our accomplishments, like for, for people who work for national life records, our pride and our passion for our accomplishments. They can overshadow the negative impacts of the refuge system due to inadequate funding. Now, this is an issue across all levels of the refuge system. Some of it we're not ever going to be able to fix, but we are trying to fix it to some extent. So, for example, at headquarters, we're analyzing how we can change our performance reporting system to better capture the negative impacts without making our employees feel bad. As we move through the next few slides, I'm going to share how we've been framing this unified narrative to help us all be better spokespeople for the national references. So we're going to start with some of these negative impacts. We're bringing attention to the sparse field support and the vital work left undone locally and across the system how it affects our customer experience and how much we really depend on volunteers and interns really talks about what we're not able to do. And some of these things um, include uh, insufficient monitoring of endangered and threatened species, which could lead to irrevocable biodiversity losses. Um, we just finalized our planning policies last week. It's a way that we're going to um, complete the next round of our comprehensive conservation plans. Those are the plans by which we um, manage national life refuges as, long, as well as those step-down plans. And you can see that we've got 60% of our refuge units are in need of a new CCP or comprehensive conservation plan. We are also using visuals to help make a strong impression like this example about the, the age of our infrastructure, showing that most structures are near or past the end of their maximum useful lifespan and compelling photos and narratives to show they continue to degrade and the wide uh, gray bar really shows the useful life of the structures you see there at the bottom. And then the dark blue shows the age of our current, or the average age of our current uh, infrastructure 
And you can see that in some cases here, like, you know, twice the age of this kid should be a big useful life. Yeah. Um, and then our inability to welcome visitors. And I think you all are really well aware of this one, that our visitor experience uh, messaging highlights the reliance on volunteers and interns to maintain operations without you all friends and volunteers, we would not be able to keep our, you know, my five visitors and it was open to the extent that we do, I'll be at And visiting, visitor experience messaging also pairs well with safety due to lack of law enforcement and deteriorating infrastructure. So with all these points, we hope to illustrate that flat and declining budgets are really unsustainable. Um, we fold the component in the middle there. We have seven states that don't have federal law enforcement. So that's 45 stations without a federal um, law enforcement officer in the United States. We are in unsafe levels, ironically. So far, I've discussed a number of the impacts that the 24 budget brings. And we'd like to wrap up this section with some general thoughts on how national refuge fits and how we plan to or intend to handle these challenging budget times. And so when it comes to workforce resilience, we're going to continue to enhance our workforce's resilience by focusing on our highest share priorities and doing the best that we can with what we have. You know, headquarters, we will continue to collaborate with the regions on natural strategies and on the planning and decrease staffing, which will unfortunately reduce education and outdoor recreational opportunities and our ability to address the bird maintenance. And to support the workforce, we really need to act like a system. You're going to have to make hard choices like reducing open hours with closing visitor centers. It's important for friends groups to support these decisions. They're not easy to make. Urging support for a single station over the entire system, particularly in terms of funding, funding it inadvertently risks reallocating our limited budget rather than expanding it, which ultimately undermines our collective mission. When an individual refuge gets special dispensation from a Congress person, for additional resources, the ref refuge system hasn't been getting additional dollars, and so then those funds are moved from other refuges or projects to give to another. It's that robbing Peter the pay Paul. We will continue our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, less resources overall translates into fewer recruitment opportunities and fewer employees to incorporate community engagement into our daily work. Now, through leveraging of other funding sources, such as the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, agreements with partners and the implementation of forward-looking policies that help address climate change, we will strive to build a more resilient system of land and waters for the benefit of wildlife and people. And we are looking for other people's money as much as we can. So in ending the presentation and leaving time for conversation and questions, I just really want to thank you for your continued dedication and for your support of the National Life Refuge System and real local refuge or refugees. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the priorities and the budget for the refuge system getting the budget in April and in May, and we should be getting it in October, creates additional challenges. So with that, I'll ask Courtney to stop sharing the presentation so that we can see each other. And John, I guess I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. And I am going to ask Sue and Cheryl, have you um, seen questions in the chat that you want to share with Cynthia? Yes. Good question. Hi, Cynthia. 
A uh, question, first question that came in was from Lisa, and it is, what is the advantage to the refuge system to have visitors? The advantage of the refuge system to have visitors? Yes. Okay. Well, I think there's lots of benefits. Well, when, well there's, there's benefits to the visitors just because they're outside and they're in nature, and that's really good for for people and for people's mental health and just for physical health as well. But for the refuge system, I think that it translates, I'm hopeful that it translates into support, right? When we, when we bring people in and hopefully they fall in love with us, then they'll be more apt to support them because where do we get our funds from? Our funds come from Congress. Who is Congress? people, how did those people get there? People voted for them. So it's probably beneficial to the refuge system to connect with people in order to do the job we need to do for wildlife. And that's where national refugees are there for wildlife and for people to fly. We need each other. Thank you. Um, Robin asked about the acronyms under leverage and funding, and thank you, Marianne, for putting all of those links in the chat. So if you're wondering what GAOA means or how to find out more about it, whatever, uh, there are links in the chat that you can click on to find out more about those acronyms and what they mean. Um, Ricky has a question. Do you feel the reduction of volunteer hours is the lagging effect of COVID or is it impacted by loss of staff in fish and wildlife service or a combination of both? Well, it's, it's a combination of both, I believe. Um, I think that, I think people think that it's primarily COVID, but if you start to look at the trend, and actually coincides with our loss in fish and wildlife service employees. And so as much as we like to blame lots of things on COVID, it had started before. I think COVID maybe exacerbated or at least highlighted that it's also because we have this decreased capacity of, of fish and wildlife service employees. We need those employees to be able to um, oversee the volunteers and, and the projects that they're doing and identify those projects all over the place. And so I truly believe that it is. Thank you. Lisa asked another question. How can other organizations be utilized? Organizations like the Boy and Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, YWCA, and so on. Well, yes, I don't know what Lisa means by utilized. I mean, I think that through our urban wildlife partnerships, um, you know, program that we have where we don't have national wildlife refugees, so those organizations are great places for us to get out and to help and tell our story um, for us to um, begin like our stepping stones to engagement, right? We go and we meet folks there and then we get them maybe out into a park, an urban park, and then we get them out into uh, or onto a national wildlife refuge. And so I, I think that it's an opportunity that we can uh, work with those um, organizations that you listed there in order to expose the National Life Refuge System to, to um, communities that maybe didn't even know that refuges existed. So I think there's a lot of good synergies there. Thank you. Um, Julie asked, as a friends group, what is the best thing we can ask of our members toward advocating for the National Wildlife Refuge System? Well, as friends, you all can ask them whatever you want to ask them. And I, it's more like I work through the Record Association, Joan and others. But I think that, I think highlighting the, the, the entire National Wildlife Refuge System and some of the things that I just shared with you, the needs that the National Wildlife Refuge System has as, as an opening. And then talking about 
is, you know, your national life refuge because, you know, all politics are local. Um, and so I think that um, the the increase, any additional increases for the refuge system, what is a challenge for us when we get increases is if they're just targeted to certain areas, then it minimizes our uh, flexibility. And also, when Congress directs us to spend money in certain areas but doesn't give us the increases to go along with that, then we got to find it from somewhere else. Thank you. Um, are there any advantages to a lot? This is from Jennifer. Are there any advantages to allowing hunting? There are clearly disadvantages. Have you been able to remove lead bullet use? <laughs> she just gonna like throw that just a little, or just, just like that, huh, Sarah? Yeah, just just a really short one for you. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends your perspective on whether you think that there's advantages or not for hunting. I mean, certainly hunting was identified in the Improvement Act in 1997 as a wildlife dependent use, and um, certainly there. are are um, places where allowing hunting helps us with managing certain populations of species. So certainly there are um, advantages. There's also advantages of connecting people. And so Pines National Life Refuge in Philadelphia has been doing a lot of outreach utilizing archery. And so they had some uh, first youth hunts using archery, and they now have, um, um, what do they call them, the pink ladies of hunting or something like that? I don't know, but there's this group of ladies that is just all engaged now with with archery, and for some cases, it's food security as well, right? And so they have totally engaged in this and um, are excited about it, and it's been another way for them to um, to connect. Our next question for you, Cynthia, is from Robin Wilt. Um, are you are going to let me address the lead bullet use? Oh, no. Go. Go for it. Go for it. I'm backing off. I'm going to shut my mouth. Lead I bullets, you're please. actually going to tell me what the Pink Ladies organization is called. <laughs> that's why I thought you came off. Me, oh, can't. that's what you think. Okay. Something. Anyway. Um, so lead bullets. Okay, so we stopped using lead for hunting waterfowl in 1991 because the science was there around wetlands, that sort of thing. Um, through the annual hunting and fishing um, rule regulations that we do every year, we have been getting increased comments that we should stop using lead um, for hunting on national objectives. The last couple of rules have had either no lead opportunities or the opportunities, the new opportunities, um, we are phasing out lead on these refugees. Um, in some, we have a mini, was a five-year um, but we have not moved forward with an overall ban on the use of lead for hunting and national refugees. We are working closely with um, the, it's a federal advisory committee act um, committee called the Hunting and Wildlife Conservation Council. They've got a subcommittee that is uh, working on this issue and we're working very closely with them. We're looking at increasing education around the use of non lead bullets, um, working with an online partnership and looking for uh, incentivizing the use of non lead So we're continuing to work on them. Thanks, Joan, for letting me respond to the lab bullet. Oops, thank you for responding to it. So the next question is really one, I think, for Refuge Association. Um, are we still organizing trips to the Hill for friends during our friends conference at NCTC? I have a learning curve issue. And this is Robin Will. So, yeah, Jeff, Libby. Sure, I can answer that. Um, it's something that we've done in the past. Yes, um, I think we haven't done it lately, 
the reason why that stopped, I believe, was because of the COVID restrictions that came in place. So nobody could really go visit the Hill. And since those restrictions have lifted, we haven't really had a good opportunity to restart that, probably because um, it's like a huge logistical challenge. It's a funding challenge. Um, so I think there's multiple challenges we have to kind of work through before we can figure out how to get those restarted again. But those that is a plan for the future. For now, we are continuing to um, go forward with what we started last year, which is providing the virtual um, virtual Hill advocacy days where folks can just do it from home um, and we can hit a bunch of offices that way. So we'll move forward with that to continue giving that opportunity for advocacy. But yes, in the future, sometime we do want to do that um, organized trip while you guys are at NCTC. Thank you, Libby. Uh, the next question is from Pat. What do you think friends groups can do best to help influence budget increases and staffing increases at the federal level? Um, thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Pat. I mean, it comes down to funding, right? And um, the challenge we have right now is a deal that Congress has cut with the NFOI 24 and 25 budget. But you know, historically, I would say that having a unified message around the means of the National Life Refuge System and then breaking that down to your refuge as, as well. I think being strategic about our authorizing and appropriations committees for those that are have refuges in those districts, I think that um, also advocating Perhaps on the House side, you know, they've reinstituted the um, National Life Refuge System Caucus. And so I think building the support of, of that caucus in the House, um, so we can see if they would, you know, what, what, what that caucus might be able to do as it grows. Libby, do you want to talk a little bit about the caucus? Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. The Congressional Wildlife Refuge Caucus just got reestablished at the end of last year. Um, there are seven co-chairs, three Republicans and four Democrats, which is incredible, really. Um, so that caucus, uh, we are still work still need to have a um, um, full meeting with them to really discuss what are the bipartisan priorities they can get behind and what can they push forward as a full coalition and you know what type of messaging do they want to put out but for now what the important thing is is just trying to get more and more house members to join that to join that caucus. Um, so friends are able to reach out to their representatives in the house and ask them to join um, that would be really impactful in the past numbers for that caucus have been well into the hundreds and currently we're still sitting around at somewhere between 40 and 50 members so we have a long way to go to bump that back up to when that caucus was really in full swing so that's a really great way for friends to help and if you want to know whether or not your member of congress your representative is a, a member of the caucus you can go to the coalition's uh, website and on one of our blogs we have a link that libby provided that shows who's uh, a member right now and how and who you need to contact to get your member of congress on that list okay um, our next question or comment is from tom he agrees that friends groups are support can support volunteer recruitment but we need uh, fish and wildlife service staff to support activities to utilize them so I agree. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to skip down to the next question from Bill. Agreed that all politics are local, but funding is distributed centrally, right? What motivates members of Congress to support all wildlife refuges nationwide? That's a great point, and and I think it's it depends, right? I mean, the great thing about the National Wildlife Refuge System is I think that we're quite funny because I think that different people see different, um, they connect differently with refugees based on their own factors, right? And so I think that the, the motivation is for them to 
recognize and understand how their refuge, and hopefully there's no refugees in this one in their district, fits within the greater system. Because every time that I talk to groups and I talk about the expansive nature of the natural and life technique system, where we start in the way things beyond for the regrowth of the birds and violence, where we have to bring down some more like and you go up towards Maine, and you go over the map, the northern communities and females, the new national monument, you go all the way up to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, beyond the west coast, the northwest, beyond Hawaii, beyond Guam, we're in side from the Mariana Island. Uh, national marine national monument, and then you go south of the equator. So the south of American Samoa, thirteen degrees south of the equator, is what is it called? Marine national monument. Back up to San Diego. Can you envision that on the road? That is that is what we're really interested to in is the national monument. And to be a part of this amazing system of lands and waters that are set aside for wildlife, for the people who go, for the first wildlife and people who thrive, wouldn't you want to be a part of that as well? I think there's a story there that we can tell first um, that shows them how their refuge fits into the creative system. Thanks, Cynthia. Hey, our next question is from Carissa, who mentioned uh, you mentioned that there is a retention issue with staff throughout the fish and wildlife system. As friends groups that may support a refuge that has frequent retention issues at their refuge, such as ours, what would you suggest that friends groups can do to help with bridging that um, gap of community frustrations of inconsistency with management of the refuge and new staff at refuge. This seems to be a prominent issue when it comes to the hunting recreational usage of our refuge. Well, I think there's there's multiple things in that sports place the woods that are called kinds of things in terms of practice and things for instance. But I, I think that the friends can play a role because I think the role that she can play is having some history with their refuge how it's worked. I think helping to support new managers as they come in. Um, you know, it works best when friends and, and refuge managers like have the same goal and they're, they're, they're heading in the same direction. I don't, I'm not suggesting that we have to um, all think alike. But at least we can't all be rolling in the same direction. And so I think that that's part of it. Some of our, and, and I think in some places, um, the retention issues are harder than in other places. I mean, we, I, I just came back from the land as much as I'm like, okay, so one of the things that we have is potentially issues there. I think we have people who have gone back home. I think that they're on their second go land or the land that is that sort of thing. Um, and there is some people that have worked out with as a third of it. And so I think it is dependent on uh, the where and perhaps even the normal test. Uh, some of our refugees, in some cases, I think are always going to have some of those um, challenges. But I think getting to kind of know each other and then um, being in all of it. I'm going to pull a standards of excellence in the this conversation. Just like we're pushing our folks to um, um, live by the standards of excellence and knowing and relating to our community, I think we friends can know and relate to the nothing standards. Being friends can be a community asset, the community being the refuge manager and the employees that works in the fishing and on those refuges. Then I think that that helps with um, bridging some of uh, those gaps. Thank you. Cynthia? Just wanted to know you're breaking up just a little bit. Okay. That's better. That's better. <laughs> Maybe okay. I started mumbling because I've been talking for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> 
We'll give you a break in a few minutes, Tao Jeff, unless you've got another one right after us. Um, Holly asked, is there another National Friends Conference coming up? And I know that's a Linda Schnee question. Linda, do you want to talk about the trainings at NCTC or the uh, uh, gatherings at NCTC that are coming up in the next few years? Sure. Thanks, Cheryl. I put it in the chat as well, um, the plan. And of course, that's always going to be um, a little bit budget dependent. But the plan is for next year, probably somewhere between April and August 2025, to have a Friends Academy, which is the smaller um, 24 participant Friends workshop uh, that usually runs for four and a half days. And that is. Um, application only and um, selected folks. So you nominate somebody or yourself uh, and that's 24 participants usually. The larger National Friends workshop that we had last year, the next one should be in 2026. So again, that's, um, it will depend. Oh, and I just got the confirm your speaking language for Arabic as well <laughs> message. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, but that's the hope. Um, and so friends, the National Friends Workshop is uh, also open to service staff who support friends, um, refuge managers and project leaders, friends liaisons. And Friends Academy is just a smaller group that is really for friends only. So people can contact me at any time with those questions. And I'll be sure to put my email uh, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Linda. Mm -hmm. Next question for Cynthia. This is from Becca. What factors determine how much a refuge gets from the total uh, National Wildlife Refuge System budget? So, do people hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, we have a budget allocation methodology that we use here in Fed Quarters, and we utilize that to determine what percentage of the budget goes to each of the individual regions. We have eight regions in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then the regions will then utilize their formulas for how they determine how much is going to each individual natural and wildlife refuge. For like the base salaries and the management capability, the dollars are used to actually run the refuge. With regards to deferred maintenance projects, we do those on a five-year basis. And so we've got a five-year plan for all of our deferred maintenance projects across the refuge system. And then each year we talk to it. Additionally, we get dollars through construction. A construction account funds all of the services construction, not just natural monarch refuge system. And unfortunately, it got cut in fiscal year 24. And so for line item construction projects in 24, we only got $11 million. And so some of this is dependent on which sub activity and, and people and salaries in those projects. Thank you. Um, for those of you who might have been Curious about the standards of excellence that Cynthia referred to. Amy put those in the chat as well so that you can see what the standards of excellence are. I know from uh, just having been at NCTC that that's a real central focus for fish and wildlife now. So it should be for friends groups as well, probably. And uh, Linda Schnee put her email address in the chat. I'm not seeing another question unless one just popped in just a second. Here, if a visitor center is selected for closure, when and how will this closure be communicated? The easy ones are left to the last, Cynthia. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Cheryl. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, these are just these are gonna be difficult, challenging conversations right now. We don't have any, like, we don't have a running list that says what's going to be closed or not. The regions, they still don't even have their budgets yet. Um, if anything were to be selected or to decrease hours, that's going to come, should come through your refuge manager. I mean, it'll start at the refuge chief down to the refuge manager, and, and I'm sure the regions will handle that. Uh, 
probably different than this, but it should at least at a minimum come from the refugee center, and I would hope that our regional refugee groups in the regions are also assisting with that as well. I can so the, no, go ahead. Next, next question in the chat is from me. So how will the public see the impact of these lousy budgets on refuges? Are you going to see places like Chincoteague cut back on their hours at visitor centers? What's going to happen? I think that's what, what we're wrestling with right now. I think we're already seeing, you know, the decreased hours at visitor centers. I think we're seeing, um, you know, the uh, um, decrease in um, management actions on refugees. Um, you're seeing that there's not as many staff at refugees and what there used to be. Those are all signs of the decreased budget. Um, but, um, we're wrestling right now with managing through the rest of the planet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next one is another easy one for you. Given the tight budget, is there a plan for meeting emergency costs associated with disasters that hit refuges, such as the flood damage on Kauai and fire damage on Oahu? This is from Lane. Right, so those are these are a little bit different, right? So um, we're always hopeful during a um, uh, natural disaster that Congress is willing to give us what is called a supplemental appropriation. And so typically if there's a disaster occurring, we will put together what our anticipated losses are. And if Congress is so inclined, they'll give us supplemental funding that is specific to repairing the damages. So that's always a good thing. With regard to fire and specifically um, a lot of forests, and I was actually able to fly over that and see some of that damage, we can get dollars through the um, wildland fire fund. It's called the Burned Area Emergency Rehabilitation uh, Fund. And so I know the Wahoo Forest has been successful in, in getting some of those funds, so they'll be using those um, on the ground. And Cynthia, the question is, is hunting and trapping permitted in uh, every refuge? Oh. Every refuge? No. no. But we do allow hunting and trapping. Uh, trapping as a management practice, as well as trapping for sporting, those are two different things. Um, all national wildlife refuges, you know, depending on state regulations and also uh, through the hunting and fishing um, sport fish rules that we uh, do every year. Okay. And another, breaking up just another, a little bit again. Okay. Another sure. hunting hunting question. Do hunting and fishing revenue go to refuges? I was trying to put in another microphone. Um certainly licenses. That does that sound any better? It's okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so, people that hunt on uh, fish on national wildlife refuges will need to purchase um, state licenses. And so, certainly, the states benefit from the revenue uh, coming from um, there as well. Um, yeah, so the hunting and, and fishing licenses are through the states, but I think that we also bring uh, through those uh, uses is economic benefits to our local communities. Um, typically, when people come on the refuges, regardless of the use that they're coming for, they're contributing to our local community. And, and also the duck stamp contribute, uh, duck hunters have to pay via duck stamp and that helps to contribute also, but correct? 
Yeah. Not, thank being, you. not being 100. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. And you don't have to be 100 to buy the duck stamps, right? So nope. the duck stamps always go into the migratory birds commission and we purchased, um, uh, we're able to purchase lands, um, acres to contribute to um, the either like lands inside of a record boundary or if we expand the boundary. So it buys habitat. And that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, another question is, can Refuge Friends volunteers man the visitor center? Well, of course they can help man the visitor center. They just can't do it like, you know, all by themselves. And that's where, where we're in need of additional staffing. But I mean, without volunteers and without friends, we can't teach our visitors from the cleaning. Um, and, and they don't just man the visitor center, right? I mean, they're helping in the cleaning, they're helping in some of the the maintenance, the educational programs, certainly communicating um, other programs so that we can have some quality visiting or experience. <laughs> and we appreciate oh. it. We need your help. Okay, Lisa's asking, can friends volunteers be trained to oversee projects? Sure, but they still need somebody that's gonna train them to do that, right? Um, but, but I mean, short answer is yes, of course. I mean, and they, that's what I'm saying. They also um, assist us with delivering education on programs and um, other, other types of uh, I was looking for the I one. Okay, I guess my brain's starting to go. <laughs> interpretation, that's what I'm trying to say. Interpretation projects, environmental education and interpretation. So Joan, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to spend time with you all to talk about where we are with our budget, what we're, you know, where we're trying to head. And I absolutely, we appreciate all of the work, timeless, energy effort, you all can choose to spend your time with someone else and you choose us and you're forever grateful for that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for spending thank this you. hour with us. We appreciate it. All right, take care. See you all next time. Take care. And folks, if you thank could just you, Cynthia. Hang on for a minute. Libby has an announcement that she'd like to share with folks about public witness. Um, getting testimony up to the uh, up to Capitol Hill. So Libby. Yeah, thanks, Joan. Um, hopefully most of you um, are subscribed to the Refuge Association's action alerts. So hopefully you had seen that there was an alert um, sometime last week about submitting public witness testimony to the House Appropriations Committee. Um, so if you haven't seen that, please check your emails for it. Eden just posted in the chat um, the link to that action alert. And the Senate just announced their their instructions for submitting um, testimony as well. Um, so we didn't put out an action alert for that yet because it just came out. But the link to those instructions are there as well in the chat. Um, so the reason why we're asking friends to submit testimony is because this is a really great opportunity for the um, Interior Appropriations Committees in both chambers, which is the committee that decides the level of funding that the refuge system will receive. Um, it's a good chance just for them to hear from people on the ground, from friends groups, from any stakeholders really that have an interest in the refuge system and um, want to communicate why it's so important that that increased funding happen. Um, so in that action alert, you'll see we provided some sample testimony to get you started, um, a sample um, witness disclosure form, which is just a form you have to submit uh, with your testimony so they know who you are. Um, but if you have any questions or um, issues working through the materials that we provided, please feel free to reach out to me. Joan um, and Corfa have also uh, sent out some guidance on this as well. So please feel free to reach out to any of us if you need any additional guidance. But we definitely are encouraging all friends groups to submit some testimony and make sure there's really good support for the refuge system um, during this entire appropriations process. Thanks, Joan. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. And let's turn it back to Sue now so she can tell you about next month's webinar. 
Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody again for attending a super great webinar and full chock full of great information. Uh, we have more to come in May. We'll be talking about environmental education programs and youth programs and the way friends can help those programs. That's May 15th. And Brianna from the Fish and Wildlife Service will be our lead. In June, we'll be having a, we'll be going back to advocacy and talking about um, how the summer recess can work in our favor. So uh, it'll be a perfect time to talk about the summer recess and how friends can actually get engaged at that level. And then in July, we'll be going back to board governance. And so uh, we'll be talking about some of the roles and responsibilities of the friends groups. So um, I think with that, uh, we'll um, see you on May 15th and uh, we'll be talking about youth programs. Thanks everybody again for joining us today. Thank you everybody. Thanks everyone.